Well, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. Um, I, how, how long have I got, roughly, to speak? Right, okay. Um, I, I would like to start, really start this talk by just saying something about my own personal experience. Um, I, mean, I studied the classical Semitic languages as a student and I, um, as a graduate and also as a postdoc, I worked with manuscripts, as Manuel was saying, I worked in the Cairo Geniza, which is a medieval manuscript collection. And uh, I was on a um, sabbatical leave uh, um, some years ago in Jerusalem and I was spending my time working on microfilms of medieval manuscripts when I thought I would for a bit of, just a bit of, get a bit of fresh air essentially, do just go out and try and meet some speakers of Aramaic whom I'd heard existed, still existed in Jerusalem. And uh, after a bit of an adventure I, I tracked down a speaker of Aramaic in, in Jerusalem. And I was not prepared for the, the deep impression this would have made on me uh, in that I suddenly found myself face to face with a native speaker of Aramaic who it seems was the final speaker of his dialect. And to actually be faced with not only a new language but realizing this man is the only speaker <coughs> made an incredibly deep impression on me. And thereafter this sparked a great passion in me to, 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 to start to study the modern Aramaic dialects. So, this, so today I want to tell you something about uh, my work over the last few years and why I believe it's so important to study these dialects. Um, now, as I've already said, um, the first thing that hit me very hard was the, the, the state of endangerment of the Neo-Aramaic dialects. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that Aramaic is a language which has been attested from a very ancient period. The, the earliest uh, inscriptions are from the 1000 BC and we have Aramaic in various written forms attested throughout the last three millennia. So it, it, one can say it has it got the, probably the language is one of the, with one of the longest recorded histories. But the truth is um, it is now in its final stages. I mean, it, is, it has survived as a spoken language right down to modern times. Uh, this is unlike Hebrew, which you know, it ceased to be vernacular, although it survived as a liturgical and written language. It ceased to be vernacular, then it's only later re-vernacularized in the 20th century. Aramaic has remained as a spoken language. So, I... Uh, first of all, I want to tell you something about the location of the various surviving Aramaic dialects. Um, Aramaic has survived in various pockets. It's normally divided into four basic subgroups. Uh, or in antiquity, I should say, Aramaic was very widely spoken. In, in pre up until the uh, rise of the Islamic period, the, the Arab conquests of the Middle East, Aramaic was very widely spoken in Mesopotamia, Syria, uh, and it was used uh, during the Achaemenid period, certainly, as the lingua franca, the administrative language of a very wide area of the Achaemenid Empire, stretching from Egypt all the way to northern India. And in fact, recently there was a discovery in Afghanistan of some Achaemenid Aramaic documents, so that gives you some idea of the extent in antiquity. Um, now, um, in, after the Arab conquests, uh, Arabic quite rapidly uh, overwhelmed most of the, sort of the, the speakers of Aramaic, at least the linguistically they, the speakers of Aramaic adopted Arabic. Um, but, um, and the whole process of Arabization is a bit of a long story, but to cut a long story short, the um, Aramaic did survive in various pockets down to modern times and uh, these have survived essentially in, say, as I said, four places, four main regions, four main subgroups. One of them is in Syria in three villages, the most well known being Ma'lula then two others in the region of Ma'lula near Damascus called um, Bach and Jub Adin um, and uh, then the other, the next subgroup is in southeastern Turkey which is just on the edge of the, on the left top edge of this map, in around Mardin, in a place known the region known as Tur Abdin, um, that is uh, west of the Tigris River. You can see it up here. Uh, now, 
Then there's another subgroup on the far bottom here, which is slightly off the map in <coughs> around Ahvaz in, in southwestern Iran, known as Mandaic. These are, this is a, these are dialects of Aramaic spoken by the Mandeans <coughs> now um, in Ahvaz and Khurram Shahar in southwest Iran, and they have still survived down to this day. Only very, very few speakers there. Now, the largest subgroup, and this is the subgroup I have been working on myself, and this is the subgroup to which the Jewish dialects belong, is, this, um, is a very large subgroup which is spoken east of the Tigris River, in northern Iraq, north, uh, western Iran, we could say, and, and southeastern Turkey. Now, perhaps I should be careful of the tenses I use here, because we're talking about, I'm not talking about the present. Uh, it's probably easy to talk about 100 years ago, almost precisely, 19, until 1915. We are living in actually a very historic period at the moment for various reasons, so which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but let's say w until 100 years ago, uh, Aramaic was spoken in a series of flourishing communities of both Jews and Christians in this area I've just described. Uh, and this, these dialects are are known as Northeastern Neo-Aramaic, Nina for short, or the Germans call it Nena, but the, we call it Nina, uh, <coughs> I'm not quite sure why. Um, but um, the, so the, the dividing line is the Tigris between the, the so-called Turabdin group, or Turoyo, as it's sometimes referred to, and the Nina group, the Northeastern the Aramaic group. And perhaps a little quick something about that boundary. If you look at the Tigris, you, 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 why is there, it, there is quite a major linguistic boundary at the Tigris and you of, one often would say, think, you know, it's because people couldn't get across the river that uh, there, there was such a big dialectal group. But in fact, really, that's not, a river is no problem to cross. Uh, it's, it's uh, it really, there are some other factors here and, and I think it, it probably is relevant to note that this, the, the Tigris was also a political and an ecclesiastical boundary and that it was a boundary in antiquity between East and the, Rome, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Persian Empires and also there is a boundary in, ch in, the, in the sort of the denominational Christian ch church, the Turabdin is basic, basically a Syrian Orthodox whereas east of the Tigris is a Nestorian church in the ex sasanian land. So I think that's a relevant point to note. So, okay, northeastern Aramaic dialects and, uh, was, uh, until, let's say, the early 20th century was spoken by Jewish and Christian communities. Now, the, um, these communities, uh, um, the, the Muslims, however, uh, in this area, spoke and still do speak other languages. They essentially, the majority of Muslims in this area I've uh, described speak uh, Kurdish, which is an Iranian language quite close to Persian. Um, so there's a communal split uh, in, in that, as a, in religious split. So the, the Muslims speak one language, Jews and Christians another. Now the point is that, as we'll see in a minute, the, even between Christians and Jews there's a, there's, a dial, there's a communal dialect split in that the Jews and the Christians speak quite different dialects of, of, of Aramaic. Um, perhaps um, something about, a little bit more about the earlier history of, of, of the region. Um, how these are the survivors of, of, of a period when Aramaic was more widely spoken. Um, and as I said, uh, they were large, they, the rest of Iraq and Syria was largely, um, was almost entirely Arabicized. Um, though we, we do get some hints in historical sources about quite what the chronology of this was. In fact, we, it seems that the Aramaic was still being spoken in central Iraq, in the area of Tikrit, for example, particularly we have some historical records, uh, certainly um, down to the Timurid times. It was the Timurid invasions which actually led to the ma major dis sort of displacement a lot of the Aramaic Christian speaking communities in, in central Iraq and they fled north. In fact we know we have a specific source referring to the um, uh, Tikriti Christians moving up north. In fact one of the villages um, 
in Karakosh, if you can just see that on the map there, some of the families tr uh, uh, trace their ancestors to uh, Tikriti immigrants. Uh, so we do have some, so it's really post-Timurid uh, times, as the, so post 14th, 15th century is the time when the, basically the, um, the geography, dialect geography sort of took place, um, sort of took shape. Now, um, okay, the Jewish communities, uh, there was a rather, the, the, uh, if you talk about today, 2015, what is the situation? Well, the situation, 2015, all Jews have left Iraq. In fact, they started to leave, leave the region already at the beginning of the, uh, the first half of the 20th century uh, in the, with the gradual uh, development of Zionism. A lot, a lot of Jews moved to Palestine. Then after the uh, foundation of the State of Israel, the vast majority of well, all Jews, essentially, of Iraq moved. So 1951 was the big year when the, the vast majority, well, essentially all Jews, moved to, to Israel from Iraq. A few Jewish women remained, but they converted to Islam and married them um, into Muslim families. Jews of Iran, uh, they survived, some of them stayed a bit longer in places like Sanandaj in the west here. Some of these, village, these towns on the west of Iran remained until the uh, Iranian uh, revolution, a uh, bit in the nine, you know, later, later, another 20 <coughs> years or so later. Um, in uh, the 1970s, they slightly after, some of them remained slightly after the, the rain, 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 Iranian Revolution, but um, essentially that Iranian Revolution was the big watershed for a lot of the Jews from uh, Aramaic speaking Jews from Iran, and they moved to, uh, again, most of them moved to Israel, and the, uh, some moved to California, <laughs> in, uh, where a lot of Iranians have moved in general. So, um, Meanwhile, in various, I should, there is one particular region in the far north east. If you can see Urmi and Salamas, which is in far in the northwest of Iran, Jews in that region already, in the first half of the 20th century, began to move northwards into the Caucasus. Uh, this was sparked off mainly by the disturbances of the First World War, which I will talk about in a minute. 19, certainly by 1915, in fact earlier than 1915, some of the Jews were already moving up, already in the 19th century, Jews were moving up north into the Caucasus uh, for variety, mainly to find safety, a refuge a re away from all the various dis political disturbances. First in the 19th century there were battles between the Russians and the Persians, then the terrible massacres and upheavals of the First World War drove a lot of the Jews northwards. into mainly settling in Tbilisi in Georgia. Uh, and then the Aramaic-speaking Jews underwent another dis displacement in 1950 when uh, Stalin put them all in cattle trucks and sent them to Almaty in Kazakhstan, uh, where they settled. And I, a couple of years ago, I actually made a trip to Kazakhstan to try and find them. And I found 30 Jewish families speaking Aramaic in Almaty. Um, so, um, that is the very, very briefly the story of the Jews. The vast majority who have survived are in Israel. Some of them, I say, in Kazakhstan. So if you want to do field work on Jewish Aramaic, you either go to Kazakhstan or Israel, essentially. Um, now, um, the point is that the Jews, both in Israel <coughs> and Kazakhstan, but let's talk about Israel, because that's where the vast majority are. Um, they, since the 1950s, they have been steadily losing their language in that, as is the, off, this is the general case with the ingathering of diaspora, the, the Jews lose their language and is replaced by Hebrew. So now only a few elderly speakers have survived who, who can speak Aramaic. That's the story, very, very brief, of the Jews. Now what about the Christians? The Christians are were a, a large, there was a larger number of Christians than Jews. Uh, there were some Jews in, uh, uh, as I said, there were basically Jews in northern Iraq, western Iran, and then there were some in southeastern Turkey, in the, particularly in the, this, the corner near Urmi, in the far, far east. Now the Christian communities were spread, scattered in a sort of larger area, 
I mean, this, we're talking about Nina now, so we're not leaving aside the Torah of Deen. The Christians were up in, into, towards, around Van. That's, this is Lake Van. You can see the lake there uh, in Turkey. Up in, around, essentially in that area of southeastern Turkey, in the Hakkari Mountains and up Botan, Hertevin is one of the, one of the, one of the centers, but also Van. I haven't marked that on the map there, but that's the, the lake there. And right across east, across that corner of southeastern Turkey, that was, uh, there were hundreds of um, Christian villages. And then across northern Iraq, and then northwest Iran, and uh, a few communities further west, further down on the western side of Iran. In fact, they, there was a Christian community in San Andaj, but most of these towns that we, which I've marked for, as Aramaic speakers were actually Jews. So in fact, the majority of Christians in Iran were further north in Urmi and Salamas. Now, the, you notice this, the, the title of this talk was the, the, the modern Aramaic of the Jews, of Christians and Jews in Iraq and Iran. There's no mention of Turkey because now as we speak there are no Aramaic speakers in Turkey. Uh, but before the First World War, there are at least 600,000 speakers of Aramaic in, in Turkey. In, um, essentially, the Christian communities have undergone a series of terrible displacements uh, over the last 100 years. Uh, 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 this is not the time, I haven't got time to go through all the details of this, but I'll try and very, very briefly, in a nutshell, sum up what happened. Essentially, the trouble began in 1915, exactly, almost exactly a, to the day, well, not, it actually happened slightly later, the main massacres began, slightly later in 1915, uh, 100 years ago, where in the, um, in the First World War, the conflicts of the First World War, the, the, the um, Ottomans um, began a kind of ethnic cleansing in, in southeastern Turkey. This uh, resulted um, in the displacement and massacre of, of, of many of the communities in southeastern Turkey and certainly clearing the whole area of, 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 of uh, Christian Aramaic speaking communities. Now uh, this of course was in the same time and the same essentially the same phenomenon as the ethnic cleansing of the Armenians and the, it was the, it was the, um, so there was a Armenian genocide and there was the what was referred to generally as the Assyrian genocide, because I should say that the majority of the Christians belonged to the Assyrian Church of the East. I mean, it's quite a complicated story about the various denominations. But basically, the Assyrian Church of the East is the main church here, and so this is referred to the Assyrian genocide. Now, the Armenian genocide was, in terms of numbers of people who lost their lives, was larger. I mean, I, I think statistics are between 1 million to 1.5 million out of original 2 million. So at the lowest estimate, 50% of the population was massacred. <coughs> now, the Assyrians were, were actually, I have estimated about 600,000 in, in Hakkari, east, southeastern Turkey, but 300,000 lost their lives. So the proportion of, of loss of life was essentially the same. These, uh, um, they were sided with the Russians, which was the problem, and then um, they tried to take... Uh, refuge behind Russian lines in Salamas. Then the, Rus the Russian Revolution happened and the Russians withdrew from the war. Therefore, the, uh, they were, there was further massacres in the, in the Salamas, Urmi region. Then the British eventually took control and, 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 and moved most of the survivors into refugee camps around Baghdad in Balkuba. Um, um, then, so that was one of the major displacements, 1915. Then we've got another uh, Throughout the last century, there were problems with the, the conflicts with the Kurds in, um, from the 1960s onwards. Various wars were going on between Kurds, Turks and the Iraqis. And many of the Assyrian villages in the north were destroyed in this sort of, again, this sort of like, um, certainly in the 1970s, the Anfal campaign there, a lot of Assyrian villages were destroyed, several hundred along the border between Turkey and Iraq. Many people fled, um, and um, so essentially, a large, all the whole of the, the communities of southeastern Turkey have 
have been, Olymp have been displaced. The in northern Iraq, the, a large proportion of the original population has been displaced. And uh, um, now in, in and western Iran, in, in Iran as well, again, uh, a lot of the population has been displaced. Um, now, this, I'm going to, what I want to do in most of the rest of the talk, explain why this is so tragic from a linguistic point of view, as well as from a human point of view. Um, but I, <coughs> perhaps I, I can't, I have to mention the fact that in fact, we are almost undergoing, the, it seems, some kind of recycling of this terrible process as we speak, because literally this year, this, well, the last few months, and even literally this week, we hear news of the displacement of or, or, or victimization of uh, Aramaic speaking communities. Now, uh, in August this year, uh, we heard the stories of, of in northern Iraq, ISIS, um, oh, ISIS taking over um, Karakosh and the whole population of, Kar whole Christian population of Karakosh being uh, ex be fleeing and, and, and evacuating the town. So, and as far as I know, they're still. Uh, in um, have not have not returned. So essentially, the, you know, the, this is a, a displacement happening before our eyes. Okay, so let me um, go on to say something about the linguistic situation here and how why this is um, very um, w w what. And first of all, let the, the first slide is something about give you a flavour of some of the, the 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 main dialectal division between um, southeastern, the, the, the so-called Turabdin group of dialects west of the Tigris and the Nina group east of the Tigris. Now, one of the most conspicuous differences is the way in which they pronounce an original long A vowel. So if you meet somebody from Turabdin, you'd say to them, Shlomo, that means, you know, it is the greeting, Salam in Arabic, Shalom in Hebrew. They say Shlomo. It's an original Hebrew, or sorry, original Aramaic, Shlama. Now, the majority of Nina speakers east of the Tigris will say Shlama. So, if somebody walked in the room and said Shlomo, you know which side of the Tigris he came from. However, as is often the case with, with dialects, there's a, a so called transition region, and this is between, this is the region of Bhutan, right? next to the Tigris there. And if you found somebody from Bhutan, they say Shloma. So <laughs> neither one nor the other. <laughs> now there's a bit of complicated historical phonology here. But um, By the way, those Bhutan people, uh, they're not in Bhutan anymore, of course. They have, uh, perhaps I didn't mention that side of the Christian story, is that uh, some of these, these communities in southeastern Turkey fled northwards and into the Caucasus and into Russia in fact. And so in Tbilisi for example you'll find a lot of speak so some surviving speakers from Van uh, and also from some of the eastern communities and in Armenia as well you'll find a few survivors of some of the dialects spoken in the Far East. The Botanis uh, did survive, they fled north and you'll find them in a one particular town called Galdabani, which is uh, just east of Tbilisi, who um, all, a lot of them still retain their typical dialect, um, but only in, and a few scattered around various parts of, the, of Russia, but um, certainly not in southeastern Turkey. Um, and then finally, sorry, I should mention right down just over the border from Zaho, there was, until the 1970s, a few villages of Christians who survived, who still speak, spoke Aramaic, but they, in the Anfal campaign, the Kurdish uprisings, they were all evacuated, and mo most of them have now settled in Belgium, where I, I found them. So actually, I, I sort of have to track down these communities in various, various parts of the world. Um, now, uh, and in fact, the um, some of them are very far flung. I mean, a lot of them have come to North America, of course, Chicago, Detroit, or some of the big centers, California. But some of them are Australia, New Zealand, right across Europe. So it's kind of a sort of global diaspora. And uh, 
very often we reduce down to the final speakers of, of these dialects. Now, perhaps I should now explain something about dialectology, which I think is important before I show this man here. Um, you notice there are a lot of villages there. The, I've, only mentioned, I've only marked a very few. But the truth is the Nina dialect consists of over 100 dialects, probably around about 150 dialects. Now, that, and most of these 150 dialects are, are either endangered or extinct already. In fact, since I started working on this, this, this field, um, they are, in fact, a large number of them have become extinct. I've actually worked with the final speakers of some of these, uh, uh, um, these dialects. And um, my, uh, these, um, uh, these final speakers can be found in various parts of the world. I mean, I've tracked down final speakers in, say, in, in Australia, in New Zealand, for example, and also the Caucasus. Uh, and sometimes, in fact, I arrive there a little bit too late in the sense that the, although, although still alive, they're not only half alive, as it were. And uh, I had a, um, an experience some years ago where I, I tracked down what, what seemed to be the final speaker, and he only had, when he was pronouncing his dialect, he seemed to only have what we call dorsal consonant. That means consonants pronounced the back of the mouth, that ch, ch, ch. And I thought this was some kind of unique phonological development that when I looked at him more closely, I realized he had no teeth. <laughs> so, and, and similarly, I met another man who seemed to be the final speaker, but he had no S's, and he was saying thot, 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 which again was quite a unique phonological development for Aramaic, no sibilance. And it's, it turned out, it seemed, that he had a lisp that he just couldn't <laughs> pronounce. So occasionally you get there too late, you don't, even the final speaker is not, it has some sort of defect, I arrived once in Tbilisi and I thought I'd found the final speaker and the man had had a stroke and he couldn't speak. So he was kind of, he could go like that, but that was too late as well. So very often, you know, we even find the, the final person speaker or quasi speaker is, is, is a bit too late. Now, okay, the, the, the reason I mentioned that the fact that there are near over 150 dialects means that therefore the kind of each dialect is different, and therefore the numbers of speakers is relatively small for some dialects. In fact, some dialects, were, even at the, when they're flourishing, they only had a, a few families were speaking these dialects. And therefore, obviously, they're very vulnerable. Um, and um, <coughs> I'm the... Now, perhaps before I, sh I give you a sample of Aramaic, I, I should just quickly tell you very briefly why what this, what significance this is. Now, why, why are there 150 dialects? Um, now, essentially, very briefly, dialectal diversity is, is one of the one of the mo one of the causes of dialectal diversity is antiquity. When languages expand or when dialects expand, very often the the origin of the the language. It, or, or is very diverse in, in where, where the sort of the outlying peripheral regions where, where the language is spread is less diverse. Um, so linguistic diversity is often a sign of, first of all, linguistic origins, but also linguistic antiquity. So it is a reflection of the antiquity of the dialects, that, that they are so diverse. And therefore we are dealing with a, a very... Uh, a, and, and I want to show this in a minute, very, and very old uh, language, uh, uh, a very old language and, 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 and spoken dialects which have very, very ancient roots. But let, before I go any further, let me just show you, play you a clip, if this audio is working, of a speaker I found in Armenia who came from the Far East. His family, he himself was born in Armenia, but his family, probably two generations back, came from southeastern Turkey from a, a village right on the very border, far edge of southeastern Turkey. Now, I'll just quickly play you a little clip. Now, 
Now, I played you that because, as far as I can establish, this is the final speaker of this dialect, and you can see he's not, not, not the, the, the bloom of youth, as it were. <laughs> so, and in fact, he's still alive, as far as I can tell, uh, though very ill. So uh, I, it's very. Um, <coughs> In fact, yeah, so I did some work with him. But this is me, again, in, this is in the Caucasus in, in, Tbil in, uh, in a village north of Tbilisi working with some of the, um, the speakers from, uh, Christian speakers from uh, Georgia. The, these, these are Christians mainly from the Urmi area. Now, I think this, this, this is really to illustrate what we should be doing in the situation when you get a, 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 a language which is so endangered. What the, the, the crucially important thing to do is language documentation. You have to go out into the field and not only simply record people, but you have to work with them. You have to work with their, with, through questioning them and gradually establishing their, 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 the linguistic structure of their, of their language. So it's a very laborious task and it is, it's not as comfortable as sitting in a library <laughs> in fact, I've had a lot of adventures uh, uh, you know, in, in my field work. In fact, I was attacked by a Rottweiler dog once because who was defending one of the final speakers who was an old lady who lived alone who was very scared of burglars. And so I was often think I should, you know, at that point I said, I think I should go back to the <laughs> working in the library. <laughs> but, but this is... This is this old lady who was telling me very enthusiastically stories, I can just... Yeah, she, basically she was a... a this, again, also illustrates the, why it's important to, to work on the documentation of these languages, not only because the languages themselves are unique, but also because they contain a lot of oral traditions, a lot of folklore, particularly folk tales, which many of these, these speakers still remember. They've passed on for generations um, from antiquity. And in, well, in fact, I say from antiquity in you know, a rather blasé way, but in fact, uh, the, what happened once, I, I was quite taken aback when, when some old man was telling me stories which bore a lot of resemblance to the Greek myths and the Odysseus uh, episodes who totally illiterate so somehow a lot, a lot of ancient folklore has been transmitted uh, and all this is being lost together with the language so it's not only linguistically important for linguistics is important for general preservation of culture um, okay now here are just a few pictures of, of, of villages in the Judy area, which is, this is the, sorry, I should point out, this is near, just over the border from Zacho. These are the people, these are some of the villages in, in the 1970s, uh, Hassan, Ishi, Harbole, some of the traditional lifestyle. And here's somebody from that village. <laughs> Yeah, okay, this is just some, he was a weaver who was telling me all about his weaving implements. Now the point is that all this life is now being obliterated. They're all, all these villages are destroyed, they're all living in the back streets of of some Belgium, Belgium sort of suburbia, and um, and their language is beginning to disappear as well. This is finally just a shot of a, a few, uh, one of the most isolated uh, Christian villages up in the far north, near the Turkish border. It's actually not marked on the map. But it's right if you go to Rwandus and go right to the border, you come to a little village called Bidjel. And um, that is, uh, I found one of the final speakers of Bidjo uh, in New Zealand. He, this is the guy with the lisp, by the way, who, uh, anyhow, I won't play the clip of that because perhaps we, we should press on a bit. 
Now, first of all, uh, let me just uh, to go back to this issue about communal dialectal splits. I said to you that the Jews and the Christians spoke different dialects. Okay, so here's an example. This is, these are the Assyrian Christians of Urmi and the Jews of Urmi. Now, uh, you can just see, I've written a few kind of items here which are, um, give you a flavor of this. For instance, the Jews, the Christians for word for house say beta, which is, I'm sure a lot of you could, uh, you'd, you'd recognize, but the Jews say bela. Uh, so there's f clear phonological differences. Sura means is small, zora in the, in the uh, Jews. Uyura, the Assyrians, Tura, different stress position of the Jews. Then you have Kpinavin, Kpinale, you say Kpinailen, the Jews. Bishtaile, Shatoe, Hamzumile, it's a different lexical element. He is speaking Maroe, Chichlile, Smuchle. And bislaile kuashe. So not only grammar but also lexicon is very different. Let me quickly play a clip of both. This is a Christian from Urumi. Itva don't study me, your mother, itva litva, itva southern melcha, Sankiro melcha, Tatraiva, or Afrika, Hachima Maruna, Hachima and Lita, rather, Chulidini a Tarale, or Afrika, just bad. Okay, this is a woman from Urumi telling the story of Achika. Now, uh, when I'm talking, I mentioned it before about the issue of, uh, of, 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 of ancient folklore. Here is this, the Achika tale being told by, by a speaker. Now, if you read about Achika, you, know, you say, oh, there are only so many versions surviving, but I, I, I've already collected several speakers who tell me the story of Afrika, <coughs> they're still alive, in other words, and it keeps changing. <laughs> now this is a Jewish uh, informant. Yeah, a slightly smaller clip, but basically, again, uh, that's another folk tale. Right, now, very briefly, why does the, um, why is a communal dialect split? Well. The short answer is that this has nothing to do with ghettoization of Jews, you know, all put behind a wall and they're not communicating with the Christians. This is a phenomenon you get actually in many languages of the Middle East. I mean, most prominently in Arabic as well, you get different communal dialects. Arabic Jews of Baghdad spoke different dialects from the Christians and Muslims. But certainly the Aramaic dialects, one of the main explanations is different migration patterns, it seems. Like the Jews of Urmi, and the Christians of Urmi, although now living both in the town of Urmi, in fact now they're not because the Jews are all in Israel, but let's say up until the 1950s, they were living side by side. If you went back a hundred years into the 19th century, most of the Christians would have been in the villages as agriculturalists, and the Jews were the only urban population. So the Jews are a very ancient urban population, but the Christians have, uh, were on the working on the land, and they, they, they simply they came into the city after the, the, the disturbances of the First World War. And also the Jews seem to move around a lot, uh, certainly. This is another point about studying these dialects, is that they tell us something about the history, migration patterns, which are not, one can't reconstruct from written sources. There are very, very ri few written sources relating to the history of these communities. Uh, for example, we know that the Jews of, of, um, of Iran they all speak a very, very similar dialect, these western areas, whereas the Jewish dialects in, the, in, in, in northern Iraq are very, very diverse. So following the principle I just described, therefore we, we, would, we can deduce that, in fact, the Iraq, Iraq was the heartland of these dialects and it spread out into Iran. And um, so certainly we know that all those communities in Iran were migrants, essentially, but when they migrated there, we're not sure. Uh, now, what else? Oh, this is just another example of dialectal split in another place, Suleymaniyeh in Iraq, which I don't, perhaps I'll, for lack of time, I won't go through. The same story. The Jews say Bela, and the Christians say Besa for house. But, uh, now, 
this is a flavour of some of the dialectal diversity in, uh, in Nina. If we just go, we take our word house again. Now, now originally this word would have been pronounced something like bythar, right? Um, in various forms of early Aramaic. And you can see there is a dialect, Gramun, which was originally in Lower Tiari in, in southeast in Turkey, which actually st they, they said Baitha, which just sounds very similar. But if you go through that list, Betha, Beta, Besa, Besha, Bela, Beya, Bia, you can see that uh, you get a very, quite a big diversity of phonological changes there. And all this is quite a relatively small geographical area, so this gives you a flavour of the dialectal diversity of, the, of this, this, this area certainly in the phonology. And uh, again, this essentially tells us something about the antiquity of these dialects, but also it tells you something about the different rates of the fact that within one chronological period, some dialects can be more archaic typologically than others. Now this very <laughs> quickly reminds me of an important principle which I've learned working in these modern dialects, is that you can, seeing the phenomenon in the modern dialects can give you some insight into ancient language because many scholars who work on ancient Semitic, they have these convoluted arguments about if they see an archaic form here and a less archaic form here, they immediately think it must be chronologically correlated. They say that the ancient form must come before the, the less ancient form. But these dialects show that this is not the case in, in, in the real life situation of languages, is that some languages, some dialects develop more quickly and more, more rapidly than others. What the reason for the dialect, for the, for the in some cases one can find explanations for greater uh, uh, speed of development. Jewish dialects are often quite more, more typologically more advanced and this may be because of the fact they're in urban centers often in greater contact with the other population, with the populations speaking different languages. Um, Jewish dialects themselves can be divided basically into two main groups and the river Zab is the big divider going, going across the area there. Um, the river Zab, dialects spoken east of the Zab have this interesting phonological change of a th to a l, so you say bela instead of betha. Now north or to the west of the Zab, like in Dohok, you say betha. Then Urmi, people who have done some work on modern Aramaic often think of Urmi being a single dialect. This is just very briefly, quickly, an insight into the fact that Urmi, although it's known certainly after the missionaries uh, created the, you know, wrote down this language in the Bible translations in the 19th century and there, there has been some, you know, a few grammars written of Urmi. It's normally thought, you know, Urmi therefore is just one, one dialect, but in fact there were over a hundred villages of Urmi in, in the Urmi plain before the First World War and uh, there was quite a lot of dialectal diversity on that uh, Urmi plain. Um, and I, I, over the last few years I've been trying to reconstruct this uh, not in Iran, but in Turlock, California, where a large quantity of, of Assyrians still live from all the Umi regions. And this is just a little chart showing some of this dialectal diversity. I won't, I see we have times going by, so I won't dwell on that. Let me just sort of come towards, trying to get towards the end of this by saying something about the historical background and why, how important these dialects are from a language point of view. First of all, I said that the in the pre, in the let's say the pre-Islamic period, there were Aramaic was widely spoken throughout Mesopotamia, um, but it's important to note that these Aramaic dialects in the north, the Nina dialects, are not direct descendants of the Aramaic of that survived from further south. For example, Talmudic Aramaic. Right. In fact, Talmudic Aramaic, and, and this is shown in a number of things like different phonological developments. For example, a het in Babylon Talmudic Aramaic becomes weakened to a h, whereas in Nina, the, the normal development is a h goes to a ch, to a velar fricative. That's, that's just one of several cases of showing that these Nina dialects in the north had a different history from the, from the dialects which have survived in literary sources from, from further south. 
Also, um, these dialects are not their direct descendants of some of the literary languages which we know originated in further north, like Syriac, of course, is the classic language of the Christians uh, <coughs> originating in Edessa. Uh, but interestingly, these dialects are not direct descendants of, it, of Syriac. They're not that Syriac can't be regarded as their ancestor. And what's interesting is that some of these dialects it preserve a more archaic form of morphology than, the, um, than Syriac. A very quick example, Syriac in the infinitive, for those of you who know who do Syriac, you have this M in the causative stem, Maqtalu, which does seem to have originated from a, an, an <coughs> analogical leveling with a participle, the M. Whereas in some dialects, particularly notably in Karakosh, on the southern periphery of Nina, you get the Aktolev form of the infinitive, which essentially is the more archaic morphology. Now, Karakosh is that this is the language which has been of the village which has been evacuated of population in the wake of ISIS. So I don't think it's been in the press at all that in fact this is threatening one of the most archaic Nina dialects. And in fact, the, this infinitive you're looking here is endangered because of ISIS. <laughs> so this is my take on the situation. How old is, are the Nina dialects? How far can we trace them back? Well, this is a rather unusual source. This is an 11th century Arabic manuscript from Saragotha. Now, you might say, what's, what's this got to do with this lecture? <laughs> well, the situation is very briefly as follows. Some years ago, I was asked to look at the uh, um, Arabic Materia Medica text, which uh, by somebody called Ibn Baklarish, a Jewish uh, physician from Saragotha, who in his Arabic treatises, he lists the various drugs and cures in different languages. So, and he had a series of ca cases where he would refer to Asuriania. And so when I first started looking at this, I thought, well, it must be Syriac. So I wasn't, I thought, well, I'm not really the right person to ask about this. But then when I looked more closely, I saw that this was referring to a language which could only be northeastern Neo Aramaic spoken east of the Tigris. For example, the word for, it says here, the, the milk of women, Lebanon is set, Tu'araf and Niset, Bisuriania, Bachta. In other words, the wo woman in Suriania is Bachta. And a Bachta is a term which is only used in northeastern Aramaic east of the Tigris. So Imba Klarish himself, I don't think, traveled to the east, but he must have got it from sources from Iraq who must have got it, some people must have done some sort of field work. I mean, some physicians must have gone out to the field and asked people, how do you say this, how do you say that? And this is a sort of example of medieval field work which has uh, emerged in um, 11th century Tharagotha. But the point is that this shows you that 11th century, the Nina dialects were being spoken in the form with some of their characteristic features. Bar Hebraeus mentions some faults in the language of the, of the speakers in, in Iraq uh, in the 13th century, which are clearly simply dialectal features. Ka'athe, he says, is a fault of some, many people who don't know Syriac, but in fact it's simply a, a prefix which you get very frequently in the Nina dialects. Okay, that's just an example of some of the sources showing how far back you can trace the Nina dialects. In fact, <coughs> There are, there, are, there are a number of reasons why we should trace them back even further, notably as far as late antiquity, because in some of these Nina dialects you get survivals of Akkadian words, which Akkadian was the language of Mesopotamia until the, during the ancient Assyrian period in the north. But some of these uh, dialects, again, Karakosh is very, very archaic, they preserve words which have not survived in literary Aramaic. So a lot of these words you won't find in Syriac. For example, Bakhshima is, is used in, Mar in Karakosh to refer to a storeroom in a house. This does seem to be direct descendant of Akkadian Bit Hashimi, which is used specifically in the Syrian dialect of Akkadian. Rachisa is a word, pile of straw. Rachitsu, you get this in, in Akkadian. Billa is used for an external door or gate in a house in Karakosh. This seems to be connected with Akkadian Abulu, which is a city gate. In Barwar, which is a region just on the Turkish border, they, when they grow rice, they grow it in a thing called Mishara, which is kind of like a paddy field. This seems to be Akkadian Musharu. 
So you get Acadian survivals of Acadian words, and this is really has a result of the fact that these dialects are ultimately they have a parallel history to the literary languages, and they've they've simply be their survival of the of the spoken Aramaic of late antiquity. Um, and then finally, a little bit of uh, more syntax here, but uh, uh, you, those of you who know Aramaic will know that you, in Imperial Arama Aramaic in the 5th century CE, you get some strange verbal forms uh, with, in which the subject is expressed by this prepositional phrase, li, so shmi'ali, I have heard. Now the point, without going into all the details of this, the point is that that is showing that a, a development which surfaces in very much in the grammar of the modern Aramaic dialects is already traceable to the Achaemenid period and it had it, so if this is the marking of the subject by an L's and a, a so-called L preposition uh, and that can be traced also in Syriac you get interferences in Syriac Syriac was a literary language but often the writers spoke Aramaic but their Aramaic was different their vernacular was different from the literary language Occasionally when they were kind of, I don't know, not concentrating, they, you get interference and you get a form like Kimle, he has arisen, which occurs in Nerdica's grammar in a classical source, for example. Uh, and I won't perhaps go into the, all the, quite the complicated question here, only to say, this is just, a, this, this is a phenomenon of ergativity in, in these dialects, but basically the subject, what I'm trying to show you here is that the subject is marked by an L pre preposition, but the, um, the origin of that is in, um, is in Imperial Aramaic, and that, I can just br briefly say, is, uh, perhaps I'll skip that, because <laughs> it, it demands this talking of, but actually what that shows you, by the way, is that um, this was from a dialect of Sanan, Jewish Sanan Daj, um, is on the far periphery in Iran, but it, what it's trying to show here is that this has got become more, more assimilated to languages of the environment. In other words, the, 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 language, the Jewish dialects in Iran are more assimilated to the languages of the environment, notably Kurdish, than the, like, the dialects of Iraq, uh, and because of this particular syntactic construction. And that, I think probably this will be my final slide. This is really just a, a showing you this phenomenon, how these Nina dialects are not, they have very ancient roots and they have these preserved, these Akkadian words and they have their own independent history. However, they have also assimilated a lot to the environment, to the ecology, linguistic ecology around them and they've developed, sometimes they've, 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 they've borrowed a lot of loan words from particularly Kurdish. But one thing that happens is very interesting, they sometimes don't borrow a word from Kurdish, but they somehow start, they change themselves to look like Kurdish. It's a kind of uh, an interesting phenomenon where you start to sort of develop a sort of uh, a phonetic resemblance without actually borrowing the loan word. And this is actually quite a common phenomenon in language. It ha actually happened in Arabic in the earlier periods where the sometimes even, you know, consciously the when, you know, I, I, some of the, my work on Arabic documents has shown that some, uh, the Arabic jurists in the early period would sometimes take Aramaic loan words and, and, and take an Arabic word which sounds like the Aramaic loan word and use the Arabic word with the meaning of the Aramaic loan word. So, and, and this is a sort of similar phenomenon whereby the Nina <coughs> and some dialects have this, this demonstrative sy system of this, that, uh, with a th basically three levels of demonstrative and they, they become like similar Kurdish words, which are the, but they're not etymologically connected, they just change their shape to look like the Kurdish words. So, I think I'd better wrap up here, but I just want to conclude by saying that um, I hope I've shown you that the, the importance of documenting these dialects for, for, for in, in many dimensions. First of all, we've got the incredibly important linguistic uh, history of these languages and the fact that they tell us so much about, they, they enrich our knowledge of, of Aramaic and Semitic uh, quite incredibly by new data and new phenomena. Also that they are not direct descendants of the classical Semitic, 
classical Aramaic languages, and therefore they're not simply corrupted later developments. They, are, they have a history of their own, and very often they have a, a more archaic history. They, their actual forms are more archaic. And secondly, they, um, uh, they, uh, I mean, they preserve uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, these old words, but, um, but they also exhibit in very interesting features of, of adaptation, linguistic adaptation to the environment through, through, through changing through language contact, which is very important for uh, understanding human language, not only just Semitic languages. But then we've got the whole phenomenon of, of the kind of the cultural world which we, these languages bring with them in there, in, with the speakers uh, bring with them this, the folklore uh, of the very, very rich corpus of folklore uh, and literature and they also bring many other aspects of culture which are of a non-linguistic level. Um, and um, and these, you know, these, these, all these phenomena were, were being transmitted generation after generation for many, many generations since antiquity. And now, over the last hundred years, they've become incredibly endangered. And as we speak this last year, they have gone through another phase of, in, uh, of endangerment. So um, what I finally say we need to do, we need to have students to go out there and document these, these languages. You can sit, isn't it? I know it's more comfortable to sit in the library. Uh, not all, all of us want to be mauled by Rottweiler dogs, or, but I would say that this is one of the most urgent tasks of Semitic philology over the next few years. Thank you. Well, uh, as I was saying, I mean, in Iraq, in Iraq in particular, so you see this in, well, not only in Iraq, in the Arab world in general, the Arabic dialects, you have a number of cases of communal dialect splits. I mean, the classic case is Baghdad, where you have, we, till the 1950s, you had three dialects, you had Jewish dialect, Muslim dialect, and a Christian dialect. And you had Jewish, and uh, across North Africa, many towns had Jewish and Christian dialects. Uh, Mosul had a Christian and Jewish dialect. They didn't cross... Iraq. Um, in fact, uh, various, there are still um, many of the Iraqi. In fact, just this, literally this week, I had a, some years ago, I wrote an article about the Jewish dialect of Heat, a small town in Mesopotamia, uh, in um, Iraq on the, on the Euphrates. And um, I just was becoming, by chance, had contact with a Muslim speaker just uh, literally a few days ago by email. And he's told me uh, how different his dialect is from the Jewish one. So anyhow, the point is that there is, in Arabic it's very common. In Hebrew, it's, uh, in Aramaic, it's very common, as we're describing. Now, as I said, it's not really because of ghettoization. It's, it's because one of the reasons is you get differences is, is different migration histories. Also, there's an, it, there is obviously the issue of so-called social distance. So it's not so much geographical distance, but social contact. So... The, the point is that often migration is connected with so, some social phenomenon, like marriage is the obvious case, you know, that, that you get people marrying other Jews, for example, or other Christians from other villages, and therefore you get this kind of communication. So it's a sort of combination of migration associated with social contact. It's not because of isolation. Uh, I mean, sometimes linguistic diversity can be created by isolation, like in the, cor in the Caucasus, for example, you get, I mean, one thing you notice if you go to Caucasus, you suddenly find yourself in front of a mountain. You can't, 
you can understand how you won't be able to get access to the language the other side of the mountain. So mountains or ge geography can create boundaries. But in this case, we're not dealing with any kind of boundaries or ghetto walls or anything. We're talking about simple migration histories, which are essentially associated with communal social relations, I would think. Mm. What role has satellite TV played in affecting the evolution of these dialects? There's like satellite TV stations in Europe. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, the, the, the satellite TV, as Jack, you say, right, Jack, and also there's, I should probably include in this sort of response, I would say, all, we should take into account, there's also something I didn't mention. Certainly after the, 19, after the end of the so-called, um, uh, after the so-called uh, no-fly zone was established in northern Iraq, there was a, quite a proliferation of an education system among the surviving Christians in the north in, in, in Nina. Um, but both, if you start with the education system, that is Crucially, they're using a standardized form of language. Basically, they're taking a literary type of language based essentially on the Ulmi dialect, growing out of a kind of language which developed in Ulmi in the, in the late 19th century, and imposing that in the education system. And similarly, in the satellite television, I mean, they have different sorts of television. I mean, uh, they're all fighting with each other. <laughs> but you get different communities. But they would tend to use... Certainly those associated with the Nina dialects would be a, basically they would be using a kind of standard form of speech. I should say that, uh, I didn't really go into this, but one of the results of the, perhaps I didn't explain this well enough, but one of the results of these, the, the displacements of, 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 the, of the Christians after the First World War was that they were all essentially, those who survived the massacres were all essentially put together in, in, in refugee camps and this created a levelling of, of different dialects and the creation of a sort of koine and that has become the basis of a lot of sort of public discourse so some of the television channels which are associated with Iraq for example and the Christians would use this sort of koine language there is an Urmi channel which is basically Urmi dialect but the koine itself is somehow so it is, has its origin in, in the Urmi dialect so, the effect would be is that there is, the, in, in particular the education system, but, all, but also the media is having a, an effect on levelling, is it probably accelerating levelling, probably accelerating loss of some of the ve very, very small dialects which have survived. I mean, it's not doing them any good, you know, if, particularly if you engage with the, the debates and you try and people try and sort of reproduce his language. I mean, some people just listen to the television just for the music, which is... <laughs> but, you know, I think these kind of, the, the sort of media education, these are the classic factors which create, which, which kill off languages. Uh, I mean, why are languages throughout the world endangered? Um, you know, nearly 75 to 90 percent of the world's languages are endangered as, at the moment. Uh, and, you know, and there are, th there are two main factors for this. One is displacement of populations. The other one is, is, is imposition of national languages through education and media. So if the Aramaic speakers are now have undergoing both of these, this cannot be good for the survival of their dialect. Now, people, some of this, the community, the Assyrian community and the Jewish community, sometimes say to me, you know, why, you know, um, you know we, we need this sort of unity, you know, particularly without a nation. And the Christians in particular say this, we need to have a unity in, a, in some kind of literary language, one language, one nation, you know, we, we don't tell us we speak loads of dialects. In fact, I have to watch what I say sometimes to the Syrian communities. And I, I think it's important to, um, it's important that we make a clear distinction here between the, what really the purpose of a scholar like myself is, and that really is to document those the surviving lang smaller dialects for to simply to um, increase our knowledge to, so for future generations of scholarship to, w to really essentially establish the primary sources which are ephemeral. 
uh, for future research. The whole question of language and community, language and identity, language and nationality, and that are incredibly important things, but I, 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 I feel that my, I feel that what, what scholars should be doing is really just get, get publishing the primary sources and um, through documentation. Uh, you, you've mentioned the, the uh, remarking of the Edwin classical Syria that it might be an effect from, from uh, some other Arabic dialects. Have you seen any other effects of either Nina or any of the modern dialects in classical Syria? Because in classical Syria we have this huge period of time where we have literary classical Syria with very little development of the language. Mm. Frozen, <laughs> so to yeah. speak. Um, and if most of these people were speaking Aramaic when writing, you know, nothing crept in, or if something crept in, is it scribes later massaged it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the point is that, you know, classical Syriac was a literary language. Uh, I mean, the question is, did it start off from the very beginning as a literary language is an interesting question. <laughs> it may never have been a vernacular, but certainly over the centuries, it became a, a standard literary language and um, you occasionally do get interferences just like with Arabic. Arabic is a, a literary, well, standard Arabic from the earliest times was a, a literary language but with the standard Arabic you sometimes get interferences uh, in the um, uh, in, in, from vernacular uh, in the Middle Ages onwards, well even from the early papyri actually. Um, but uh, same with Syriac, occasionally you do find interferences from the vernacular. Some of them actually include these L suffixes like timle, that occurs, for example. You do get these L's marking subjects. Now, other, other examples, um, well, um, you don't get, I mean, I can't put my finger on many of these. I mean, they tend to be um, in, uh, they tend to be in syntax. Uh, um, in particular, that 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 construction of, of verbs, um, you um, I think you know there was quite a. I mean, it is quite it is quite amazing how s classical Syriac, as far as I can see, was was immune to the vernaculars. I mean, um, <coughs> but I mean the truth is, I mean that that it would be an interesting project to sort of trawl through a lot of classical Syriac with a with a modern Aramaic eye. I have not done it myself. I've just sort of picked up the odd bit just casually when I'm occasionally reading things in Syriac. But I mean, it would be a nice project. So, so many to do. <coughs> Aramaic, uh, people who spoke Aramaic in recent years have always been a minority in the society right. in which they lived, mm. uh, which was primarily Arabic speaking people, Muslims. And as an experience with this, in the United States now, Spanish people who come here, within one or two generations, the kids all talk English. They try yeah. to teach that Spanish a little bit, mm. but it disappeared. The same with Yiddish among the Jewish people. Mm. So in this regard, uh, other than the little villages where people are totally isolated, how did Aramaic even survive in the urban centers at all? Or did it? Yeah, well, I think that the, 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 gen the sim simple answer to that is that uh, the phenomenon of language as a, a sort of a monolingual society like we have certainly in England and North, well, uh, I suppose we can't say that England and America are monolingual exactly because there are lots of different communities, but the general phenomenon of monolingualism is, is, is really a, was not the, the model in most of the world. I mean, and, and when these communities of as I say, let's just take the Jews who lived in Urmi, for example, who spoke a Aramaic dialect. They would not only speak Aramaic, they would be at least bilingual, all of them. In fact, if not trilingual. They, the Jews of Urmi would, would speak both the Aramaic dialect, which was the language of their community, their family, their relatives, but also they would speak the language of the general population, yeah. which was uh, in recent centuries, well, last couple of centuries or so at least, it was... Azeri Turkish, I mean, it seems to have been originally Kurdish, then even before that Arabic, 
By the way, there's another interesting factor. Something that brought up this question we were, had at a conference yesterday about the, the how Arabic was, you know, spread in how how far was Arabic sort of spoken in in the east in Iran, and some of these Aramaic dialects tell us if you drill down into them, it, they show evidence that the speakers were at some point exposed to Arabic. For instance, the Jews of Urmi have words in them, in their dialect, which actually could only come from Arabic. Whereas now Arabic's not spoken to Urmi. But so it shows you that the Jews of Urmi also spoke Arabic at some point. So, um, so the point is that the, the, the simple answer is that they, they survived because of there was, there was maintaining this phenomenon of, of multi multilingualism whereby you have a languages for different purposes. Now this is not happening in, in England, North America. I mean, this the idea of languages for different purposes is not. And, it, and probably one of the factors involved, I mean, the, I'm sure there are variety of factors, but this factor of multi, multimedia type of pressure of things like multimedia or me media pressure is probably one of the factors which is creating this uh, loss of, la of communal languages because, um, for example, Jews or Christians in, in their various communities speaking Aramaic, all their kind of social life would have been in these communities. So if they, they wanted to hear the news or to hear stories, they'd all be talking in their dialect among themselves. They didn't have to stream some kind of standard language like in a, in a media, which is that they, they would have their internal well, it entertainment apply system. To the first generation. Mm. If you're second, third, fourth generation, that is no longer the case. Yeah. And then it became more yeah. Limited. yeah. That's too bad. So maybe we not, not have a question. question. Yeah. yeah, I want to ask you whether. Um, I mean, am I seeing this roughly right? So the long-term history of Alamo, mm -hmm. that uh, in ancient times it's the language of the plains, it's now disappeared from the plains. It survived into modern times in refugee communities, very likely in the mountains. Mm -hmm. But the mountainous areas which in which it has survived, none of them were originally Aramaic speaking in ancient times. Is that about right? Well, um, one can reconstruct linguistically that the, the heartland of these Nina dialects does seem to have been in northern Iraq, uh, not, in, not in the mountains, certainly not in the mountains of western Iran, uh, and probably not in the Hakari mountains either, because uh, you get the greatest diversity in Iraq and the plains. Though, um, the, and the, it's true that uh, the mountains did play a role in the preservation of these dialects in that you know, they were a refuge. I mean, and particularly in the Timurid invasions where a lot of the Christians went, even actually from the plains of which, where the, now the Nina dialects were spoken, right, they, if the Christians fled right into the mountains and then, some, then they gradually returned. Um, so mountains were a refuge um, and so um, that explains why a lot of the dialects survived in the, the mount, some of the mountainous regions. But um, the, um, yeah, I mean, that's basically the situation, uh, is that the, um, the plains do seem to have been, as far as I can, you know, linguist, on linguistic grounds, you compare the dialects. It, it is the, the if, if you look at where the most dialects are concentrated, they're on the, the plains, actually of northern Iraq, or, or let's say from essentially Karakosh, just quickly look at that map. Uh, um, Karakosh is the southern periphery, but all the way up to the, the border of Turkey, basically, across to Rustaka, Rwanda. Then over that, a that area, between, between the Zab, the Tigris and the Zab, uh, to Rustaka, that is where the greatest diversity of dialects are found. So, I would hypothesize that's what the origin of this group is, the subgroup. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure that answered your question, but I think, yeah. Well, uh, we have to, uh, to end yeah. now because the room is um, going to be needed for seminars. So, uh,
Well, we would like to thank you again for this wonderful talk.